I mentioned Sunday school. How many of you were, had a class this week where you studied in Sunday school? Okay, so see, a lot of you need to be back in there. I understand it's, it's a weird time, but uh, let's be praying that um, we can make that happen. The reason I bring that up is I told my class this morning, that if you taught, I got up, you know, I, I got up pretty early this morning, and I went in and began to read, and, and I just decided to, to go read one of my favorite commentators on the book of Romans. And uh, as you know, I've been preaching from Romans 12 all this time, and who would have thought there was so much here? You ain't seen nothing yet um, till you look at the book of Romans as a whole. And so I began reading this morning in one of my top three favorite commentators. I have his, his, work, his work on Romans entails, I think, four or five volumes, four or five books. So I was in the, in the volume that uh, dealt with Romans 8, and I began to read on uh, at beginning at verse 19 or 18, depending on how they divide it up. Because after I read the Sunday school material, I thought, yeah, there's, there's more here than that, a lot more here. So let me just do my preacher thing and dive in. So two hours later, at about, you know, I started reading about 6.30, about 8.30, two hours later, I'd read four chapters and a commentary on the Sunday school lesson. And so we were expected to teach it in 45 minutes or 30. How are you, how are you supposed to do that? I told my class, I, you know, honestly, honestly, I could preach that one passage for six weeks. And so could you. There's that, that much there. And so what has been a blessing is that, number one, the Sunday school lesson is not going to cover Romans 12. So you won't have to reiterate all this other stuff. Although, if it did, y'all could just use that time discussing an application of what we've talked about. Chapter 12 is that dividing line that exists in every single letter of Paul. Every letter, if you're here on Wednesday night, hold on. It's coming. It might be two years from now, but we're getting to Paul's epistles. One thing you will learn is that in every one of Paul's epistles, there is a point at which he moves from, okay, here's what I've told you about God. Now here's what you do with it. Romans 12.1 is that point. This is the watershed. Everything up to chapter 12, verse 1, is Paul telling us what God has done for us in salvation. That's what we're talking about Sun school right now. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You could, you could never get through talking about that. But then you get to chapter 12. Paul changes gears. Here's what you do. God has done so much. It deserves nothing less than you being a living sacrifice. Totally, ultimately, completely. I don't have to add anything to that. The imagery ought to impress you. It ought to communicate to you what God is asking of you. If your idea of Christianity is the American light version, which unfortunately most of us have been exposed to for far too long, you think maybe you can take it or leave it, that everything else uh, will, can come ahead of that, determining, determined by your discernment and your will. And the answer is no, it can't. And one of the gals in class, and man, I appreciate their input this morning, and next week, we're looking at 828, which has been misused, abused, and misunderstood for as long as I can remember, as, as long as the Bible's been written. 828 ain't about you or me. It's about God. For all things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called, people don't like to think about that, who are the called according what? To his purpose. 828, all things don't work out the way I want them to. That's not what it says. What that verse says is all things work together for good to those who are called. And all things work together according to his purpose. It's about him. And when you pray, how do you pray? You can't don't always know what to pray. If you studied Sunday school last this morning, you pray knowing the Holy Spirit comes along beside of you. And he groans. Have you ever, I told the class, I've never seen that. There's three, three entities that groan. Creation, me, and the Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit doesn't come alongside me and explain everything. He doesn't have to. I don't have to know God's will to pray. Do you? Nope. As a matter of fact, most of the time you won't. The reason I'm bringing this up is because this first gift that we're going to talk about today is misused, or use the same words I used a moment ago, misused, abused, misunderstood. The first gift in Paul's list in Romans chapter 12 is prophecy. Let me go back and just read those couple of verses, beginning in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, all members have the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ. So it's about the church. Your Christian life centers on the church. It's about how you serve in and through the church. Anybody that tells you I can be a Christian not going to church as good as I can going to church does not know the Bible. They are misusing, misrepresenting what the New Testament says. You can't. Uh, you need to be involved, hooked up, linked to working, serving in and through a local body. God's going to ask you about it one day. He is. It's the first thing he's going to ask you. How would you build my church? So it's about his body. And he continues. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. This is not about individualistic Christianity. I'm not a lone ranger. American Christianity says my faith is a private thing. That's baloney hogwash, otherwise a lie. <laughs> it's not correct. Your faith's not private. Your faith's the most public thing about you. Your involvement as a Christian is not private. Throw your rights out the window. That's why it's so hard to, for churches in America to be biblical. We claim we are New Testament churches. No, we're not. We're not even close. The reason being is we don't, don't have the pressure of persecution to where we have to be. We don't know what suffering is, and so we can't live out these principles. It makes it tough to communicate them. Then he says this. The thing you need to know about the body is verse 6, that we have gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We have different gifts. By the way, in that way, the church is a representation of God. What is God? He is one and he is three. People who don't understand the Trinity don't want to understand God. You can't explain God. The Trinity is very logical. They are not all the same person all at the same time and all the same way that's an that's a, a logical impossibility but they are one or three in one they are of the same essence there is one godhead they there is diversity in the same way god built programs his church to where there is diversity somebody say amen for that I'm glad you're not like me. Trust me. You wouldn't want to be, right? Pressure. At the same time, I'm glad I'm not like you. That's not a dismissal of either one of us. That's just a statement and appreciation of God's diversity. A lot of times I've seen, I've seen people disenfranchised, get jealous, envious. You can spot that. People claim they don't have it, but you can spot it 10 miles away. They're always envious of what somebody else does. <laughs> How's that going to fly when you stand before God? Well, I wanted to do this, but they wouldn't let me. Trust me. I don't know of a situation where any person ever wanted to exercise a true spiritual gift with the right heart, humility, and attitude. And a church or a pastor said, no, nope, we don't want you to. Now, if they did, you ought to go leave. You ought to leave. Find somewhere else. Now, I didn't say pastors haven't said sometimes, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Why? Because there are qualifications of some of these gifts. Sometimes the whole church looks at you and sees you in a way you can't see yourself. 
You think you're gifted in one way, and the church knows better. That's why we got a nominating committee. That I'm not trying to be, you know, abrasive. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. We recognize diversity. And if you are gifted in a way other than what you think, you ought to welcome the help in finding what that gifting is. Now, I mentioned last week this idea we have in Southern America churches. Not South America, Southern America churches. This idea of calling when it comes to preachers. Do I believe in that? Yes, I do. But I think it happens in ways different than what some people believe. We have come to the conclusion that a person is called in a moment of emotional pull. And a moment of an emotional manipulation. When the, an altar call is given. If you've been coming here long, you've never heard me manipulate anybody. You've never heard me say, if you're not saved, raise your hands one, two, three, repeat after me, and you're good. You've never heard me say that. But here's why. I'm not a huckster. I know that. <laughs> I, I, I don't have it in me to be. I'm just, I'm just not. I'm, I'm not a manipulator. I, don't, I never want to be a manipulator from here. But if I chose to use tactics that have been used for generations... In invitations, I could make you believe and think and feel basically anything I wanted to make you believe and think or feel over the course of time. If I practiced my craft enough and learned how to guilt you or scare you, I could get you down to this altar and believe whatever I want you to believe. But that's not my purpose. And you've noticed I don't give a ton of invitations. I trust the word of God. And, I, and do I give invitation to my message? Yes. My call every single time I preach is to believe this. Respond to this. If you're not saved, be saved. If, if you don't know Jesus, confess your sin, repent, and, and believe. But this whole emotional manipulation has led to a misunderstanding of some of these important offices and functions of the local church. None is greater than this first one. So here's the first one on the list. Having then gifts get differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, there's the first one, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So many things I need to tell you, so let's get going. It serves us to note something very important. This gift of prophecy is... Always, in the other places where it is mentioned, it is always placed directly and closely related, directly to and closely related to the gift of the apostles. Prophecy in the Bible is a, is a unique and misunderstood gifting. Now, suffice it to say that I believe there are gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament in the book of Acts. That are absolutely not necessary now. In one sense, I would place this gift in that category. I would place in the same category the gifts of healing and the gifts of speaking in tongues. Now, I'm not going to rule out and say that God can't use either one of them because God is God. But I'm here to tell you. That in a place where everyone speaks the same language and can at least moderately understand the language of the speaker, the gift of tongues is not needed. And the gift of tongues is senseless used in any other way. That's what you read in the book of Corinthians. That's exactly what they were doing. They had made the gift of tongues a heavenly language. There's no need for a heavenly language nobody can understand. Who does that help? Nobody. Who does that confuse? Everybody. By the way, if you, ever, if you listen closely, they're all the same words. With the same inflection. You ever noticed that? I'm just telling you, you could practice and do it too. Don't try it in here. But you could practice. It's not that difficult. It's really not that hard. And in most cases, it's a sham. It's a con. 
You say, Pastor, are you sure? Positive. Positive. I have heard testimonies where, in some cases, the tongues that are spoken, people have understood them to be a, a real, literal other language, and actually there was, there was blasphemy being communicated. So if someone was to stand up, I don't think we have anybody here that can speak in Chinese. If a person stood up and began to act like they were speaking in tongues and spoke in Chinese and blasphemed the name of God, not a single one of us would know. <laughs> but what if there's somebody here who can understand that? Well, those things are real. So the gift of tongue, I'm a, what that means is I'm a cessationist. I believe that certain of these gifts have passed because their usefulness has passed. In the New Testament, early church, the gift of tongues was necessary both as a sign and as a mode of communication. Because there were times when the dialects were so different and the gospel needing to be communicated, God gave a person the gift of tongues to speak in a different dialect so the gospel could be communicated. Early on, it was a sign that the Holy Spirit had come upon and indwelled certain believers. You can read at least two cases of that in the book of Acts. Had God not done that, those two uh, people groups would have been disenfranchised, but his enabling them to speak in tongues connected them to the day of Pentecost, and everybody knew that it was of God. Healing. gift of healing was about uh, demonstration of God's power about convincing people of the veracity, the truthfulness of the gospel through a miraculous display of healing. Today, the gift of healing is used uh, by hucksters. It's used by false prophets. It is purported to be used by men and women who, quite frankly, want nothing more than the little green slips of fabric and paper that are in your wallet. That's what they want. They want your money. The marks of a false prophet are very clear. There's always sexual impropriety. There's always uh, mistruth. There's always heresy. And there's always money. Always greed. So that's another gift that I don't think there's a need for now. We don't need that. Now can God uh, answer a prayer of a pastor praying for someone to be healed? If I didn't think he would, I wouldn't do it. And if you don't think he can and might, you shouldn't pray for that either. But that's not the gift of instantaneously touching and healing. Both of, these, both of those were, were prevalent among the apostles. So was this one, the gift of prophecy. Except I think there are some things that overlap in this gift even till today, and will last until Jesus returns. And I think I will be able to explain to you what I mean. So in every case, whenever the gift of prophecy is mentioned, it's always closely tied to the apostle. So I think primarily it was an apostolic gift. It entailed the giving of a specific word from God to men who were then tasked with communicating that word to the intended audience. Often it detailed the telling or, or, or entailed the foretelling of future events. Prophets in the New Testament were not always public figures. They weren't always a big deal in the church. Sometimes a person had the gift of prophecy in a local congregation. And the only people who ever knew it was that local congregation of 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever it was. They weren't, you know, on billboards holding big rallies in the Roman Colosseum. It didn't work that way, all right? And so the gift of prophecy in the Bible primarily is a New Testament confined gift. Yet we also see it in the Old Testament. But it's difficult for us in our day to understand all that it meant back then. We have a completed word from God. There is nothing whatsoever that needs to be added in your life or mine to this book. Nothing. And we were talking to Sunday school this morning. Why does the Holy Spirit have to come beside us and help us bear our burden in prayer? If you'll read it, it's simple because we don't know what to ask for because we don't know God's will. Your mother or father are laying on a bed dying. How do you pray? Do you know that it's God's will they be healed? No, you do not. 
Do you know that it's God's will? They die. No, you do not. But do you pray? Yes, you do. Why? Because that's the groaning, right? And that's when the Holy Spirit comes along beside of us when we don't know what to ask because we don't know what God's will is. And the whole point I make it is we don't have to know God's will to trust Him. You got these people always wanting to know, you know, I, gotta, I just want to be in the center of God's will. I want to know exactly my next step. Oh boy, let me tell you something. I've heard preachers say this. God told them, you know, this is, you know where I'm at on this, right? I'm not going to try to make, I'm not going to try to make this uh, humorous, but I can't help but to laugh. God told me I was supposed to marry my wife. That's what people say. I've heard it. I've heard preachers say that. And I remember as a kid looking at him and looking at his wife and said, well, you know what? There's no way she would have married you unless God told her to. There's something that reeks of manipulation there. You see, I believe God has his will revealed. And inside of that will, they're, they're like bumper, like guardrails on the highway of life. You can live and stay inside of God's will. If you get outside of God's will, you most likely run off a cliff. What that means is God doesn't necessarily tell you specifically exactly what you're supposed to do at every point in life. God did not tell you who to marry. Now you may have been assured. You may have been confident. But the reason you were assured and confident is number one, you thought she was beautiful. If you didn't, you probably wouldn't have married her. Number two, she was a Christian. Or you wouldn't have Asked her, right? You're in God's will. It ain't wrong to think somebody's beautiful. It is wrong to marry outside of the faith so they're a Christian. And put all the other spiritual biblical check boxes there. Check all of them. Guess what? You're inside the guardrails. Guardrails. You find somebody inside those guardrails. And I think the Holy Spirit says, have at it. Now. Does that mean that God doesn't facilitate and help us and guide us? No. But God did not open the top of our head and tell us she's the one. If, he, if you went out and told her that, she probably would have thought you were crazy and she would have been right to run from you as fast as she could. God doesn't waste details and this gift of prophecy on those little minor things inside of his will God's given us a certain amount of freedom you understand and if you're wringing your hands over every detail of life oh what's God's will get over it he's told you what his will is stay in the guardrails and live that's the answer but prophecy what was it a lot of people claim to have it, but in the Old Testament, the Greek, well, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament times, there was a Greek word for it. The Greek word, yeah, here I go. You got to understand this. The Greek word for prophet literally means one who stands in front of another person and speaks for him. Physically stands in front of another person and speaks for him. For him. Let me give you the example. That is found in the book of Exodus chapter 4. I don't know if I've got that there. Not great. I'm going to read it. And here, this is Moses and Aaron. And so here's the, here's the passage. You shall speak unto them. And this is God's acquiescence to Moses. You shall speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. And he will be your spokesman unto the people. And he shall be even, he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And you shall be to him instead of God. That is prophecy defined. One has the message, another stands in front of him, just like Aaron, before Pharaoh, stood in front of Moses. Aaron spoke, but it originated from Moses as God had told him. 
So all God was doing, if you read that passage, was adding an extra step. Moses, instead of me standing here and you standing in front of me speaking like I've asked you to and you really should have, <laughs> I'm going to allow this. I'm going to allow Aaron to stand in front of you like you should be standing in front of me. When I put words in your heart, you speak them into his ear and he'll be unto you like you should be to me. And I, well, you, you get it, right? One who stands in front of another and speaks for them. When you think about it, in the early church, there seems to have been many people who had been given the gift of prophecy, not just the apostles. There were instances, and Paul devotes almost an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 14 to discuss this, this gift and the gift of, of tongues, which seem to go together as well, prophecy and the gift of tongues. And so what it means there, whenever in the New Testament it is, you see it active, it's, it's always the, 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 the communication of a word of revelation. And so when a person spoke in a gift of tongues, number one, it was always in a language the hearers could understand. But the only reason, another primary reason it was also given is, was in conjunction with the gift of prophecy. So that that person in the language that the hearers could understand could communicate a principle from God that he wanted them to know. Because he had told the prophet what to say. Now, there's probably not a church in America, in the world, where that happens. I don't know that it has happened since A.D. 100, A.D. 200, I don't know. And why do I say that? But, but there's no reason for it. The, the, these episodes were meant to convey doctrine, truth, principle. And the difference between these prophets and the apostles also, sometimes there'd be a prophet in a church, but he was an apostle. The difference is the prophet in the church that gift came and went. In other words, if God moved on you and you spoke a word of prophecy to that congregation, that might be it for a long time. You couldn't go out at dinner with your wife, honey. God just told me. God just told me that we need to do this and do this. That's not what it was. It would come on a person and then leave, but it was always the benefit of the church. But when it came to the apostles, that gift of prophecy was abiding. How do we know that? They wrote. And the apostles who were charged and who were blessed to write these words were exercising their gift of prophecy. And that's what God was doing in them and through them. And so in these senses, the gift of prophecy, like apostleship, is no longer needed because we have the result of their combined efforts, their combined gifts of prophecy. So when you go by a church and you see that the leader of that church is apostle so-and-so, you can almost guarantee that they believe that apostle can speak a word of prophecy. Now here's the problem. Number one, we don't need it. God said all he needs to say. All he wanted to say, or he said more. All right, you agree with that? You can say amen even though you are muzzled. It's okay. Shake your head, raise your hand, point at me, whatever. And number two, almost every single time when we purport or claim to have an additional word, it's an error. And it takes us on a wrong path. I have actually been called out on this from preaching this here. People got upset with me when I called out Joyce Meyer, who is a prophetess extraordinaire of the Word of Faith movement. When you hear the phrase, speak a word or word of faith, that implies a couple of things. Number one, they are speaking directly. They're speaking what God supposedly directly told them. Joyce does it all the time. Problem is, the things she has spoken that go beyond what the scripture says have all been wrong. As in her theory of atonement. She believes that God, uh, she believes that Jesus paid for our sin by Satan beating him up, basically. What a foolish, ignorant thing to say. 
But then again, in our more civilized areas of religion, some of you ladies love Beth Moore Bible studies. Let me be honest with you. I'm not just picking on her to be picking on her. It, that, frankly, that's too easy. I'm picking on her because it's serious business. The problem with Beth Moore is she claims over and over and over again in her books to have another word from God. She'll phrase it like this. God woke me up last night for an hour. He poured into my spirit. Okay. Can God pour into your spirit for an hour? Yeah. He did mine this morning. But I was reading the Bible and principles about the Bible. I wasn't in a trance. Most time I wake up, it's whatever I had for supper. You know, that's what's going on. It's not God pouring in a word. God doesn't do that. And, and we also make this mistake, and I've heard good, well-intentioned pastors. And I heard one of my students said this. I wanted to correct him so bad, but I didn't. I was just patient. I didn't say it. We're talking about when to build and when not to build. Should a church build or not build? And one of my students said, well, that's when a pastor better have a word from God. I'm like, yeah, I do have a word from God. It's, it's in between these two black covers here. But God's never awakened me and said, build it and they will come. He's never said that. He's never instructed me whether to remodel or build or whatever. Number one, God expects me to use common sense in the context of what's happening in the moment, in the culture, in the economic world, all of that, and in, in, our, in my church's heart, he's never given me that word. Now, that's not to say God cannot assure. God cannot give peace. We know those are all biblical things. But that is to say God does not need to detail specific information at every turn in life. He just doesn't. Now, there are some Extraordinary testimonies of dreams and things that people have had. And though, again, we were watching, uh, Lord and I were watching a documentary last night. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to sound real spiritual here. You guys were watching uh, Blue Bloods reruns, and we were watching a documentary on the life of Corey Ten Boom. Doesn't that make us special? Well, we'd already seen everything else. That's why we turned over there. But anyway, Lori found it. And you know, listening to her life, you've ever read her life, it's an amazing story. There's no doubt in my mind, she was a God-driven and protected woman. No doubt about it. Never claimed to be a pastor. Never spoke words of prophecy. But she does claim that God gave uh, her sister information in a dream. And lo and behold, that 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 dream in most of the details came true. The thing is, there's some differences. That was never published before it happened. It was not meant for the church. It was not given in a way to, to help anybody outside of their specific situation. It was given in a moment they were in a life-threatening, despairing situation in a Nazi concentration camp. And her sister had the dream and said, we will be released. And her sister died. Corey was released within the year. Is that prophecy? No. No. But I would say that's a unique situation. We need to be careful. My point being that we don't go out on a limb claiming what God has told us. There are reasons for that. There's a limitation into this gift. You look at this, in this phrase, phrasing here, and I'll explain the limitation will be done. He says, if it's prophecy, verse number six, if that's your gift, then let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. There is a limitation to this gifting. Here's why I know that. You see that word proportion there? That word proportion means means analogy. It's a word from which we get analogy. What is an analogy? An analogy is, is a, a word picture or a story that is meant to, to convey the likeness 
of a principle or something else. I, I, that's close enough. I, I'm sure there's a, a better, more succinct definition. But analogy has to do with likeness or comparison. Okay, you compare uh, this story with what you're going through in life, and if it contains principles and speaks to you, that's an analogy. Well, what that word means is that we, and here's what Paul was saying, it spawned this whole theological principle, and the scholars uh, use this principle, and they have en they've entitled it the analogy of faith. Now, what does that mean? It's a, a principle of hermeneutics. How do we interpret the Bible? We cannot make any part of the Bible say something that does not agree with all the rest of it. Now, that wipes out 99.9% .9 of all the cults that have ever existed. Because what happens is somebody comes along and they say, I've got a word from God. Joseph Smith had a word from God. That's what he said. Amazing thing was Joseph Smith was a horse thief and a treasure hunter. He was arrested one time for digging up somebody's backyard. In other words, here's my official uh, analysis. He was nuts. But he had a word from God. That's what he said. And people believed him. That has spawned an entire heretical, false, false system of Christianity. All because he said he had a word from God. When did that start? Very early. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1. But though we are an angel from heaven. There you go, Joseph Smith. <laughs> though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Paul was saying, I'm an apostle. I have authority. I'm a prophet. What I said, whatever you say, better agree with it. Now, I'm not saying that because <laughs> I'm not a prophet. I'm not an apostle. But they were. And he knew he was inspired to preach to them in that moment. And so he says, whatever I have preached to you, if somebody comes along and preaches something different, let them be accursed. Anathema. Well, every single cult you've ever heard of had its beginning with somebody having a word from God. What does the Bible say about the word we have? Let me finish up by giving you some of these passages. I think I have one listed here. 2 Peter chapter 1. A couple of verses. Grady, just keep up, man, best you can. When you see I'm done with that, and flip to the next one. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Do you read that? You see how that fits into this context? A more sure word of prophecy. Which one is that? Old Apostle Simon Peter. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. This wasn't given for anyone's private use. It was given for us. And all those who would be called to God and all those who would follow him. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. That word means they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. But then he speaks this warning. But there were false prophets also among the people. And I will add even as today. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness. Remember I told you greed was always involved with covetousness. I want your money. They shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. Mm. That's enough to cut off TBN any day, right? Somebody claims to have a word from God. What they want is your money. There it is in the Bible. I didn't make that up. The Bible says it. They, with feign words, want to make merchandise of you whose judgment now of long time lingers not. Their damnation slumbers not. <laughs> Let me get back to that principle. The pastor's in one way or another, possess the gift of prophecy. 
Possibly the gift of prophecy may be in some way connected to the gift of a teacher. But it's not us getting a word from God to speak on our own. It's getting the word of God in our hearts and minds and then speaking that. A lot of people, even well-meaning pastors, will try to position themselves as a man of God who is in some way higher, more knowledgeable, more spiritual than you piddly peons on the pew are. That's good alliteration, by the way. Piddly peons on the pew. That's how some preachers see it. I know they do. And what God tells them is more important than what you think. No. I'm here to tell you this. As long as I'm here, you don't have to be afraid of that. What God has told us is more important than what you or I think. Okay? And so, what does God say? Well, recently, we've had all kinds of claims. I told you the other day, and I'm going to hush because I'm out of time. Some of you have posted Greg Locke on Facebook. Let me encourage you not to. He's a false prophet, heretic. Left his wife in a women's shelter. Married his church secretary. Yet because he has a very conservative political stance, good Christians will post him over and over and over. He has nothing about his life that qualifies him to even be connected to a church as a leader. And yet... An undiscerning world driven by a hunger for political victory will post him because he sounds preachy and he is is conservative. I told you the other day, and Shane asked me what's his name, so I told him, might as well tell you. There it is, Greg Locke. You know what he said? He said "Mm, three weeks after the election, and this is not a statement about what you think about it. You can believe whatever you want to about it. I'm, I'm pointing at him, okay? His words were, God told me this is not over. The election will be overturned. That's what he said. Let's get off the internet. Let's go to a, you know, another fairly local congregation having a Bible conference. Or actually it's another state. I heard this from somebody who was there. Pastor gets up before the Obama-McCain election, I think. Either Obama-McCain or whoever the second guy was that ran against Obama. And he said this in a youth conference. He said, a youth conference, this is what's so dangerous. A youth conference. He said, God told me. It's going to be okay. God told me Obama will not win. He said that to a youth conference. Now those young people heard it because some of them got back on the bus and spoke to this pastor who had taken them down there and said, actually it was during the election this conference occurred and the next day Obama had won. That's the way it goes. And so coming home, they're like, What do we do with that? That man of God said God told him this would be the outcome. And it wasn't. How do we believe anything else he said? (laughs) How do you answer that? Here's what we do. Just like Greg Locke and everybody else, you know, we, we, we come up with excuses after the fact and we just go on like, you know, nothing ever happened. Ah, that's not what I meant. I meant God told me that this conservative resurgence is not over. We've got four more years to plan for this and blah, blah, blah. That's sort of what he said. Well, nice try, buddy. You're a false prophet. And if I stand here or an angel stands here, borrowing Paul's words, and tells you something that does not come true, and, if, and, tell, and I tell you God told me, and in fact, the opposite happens, you need to label me a false prophet. That's what the Bible says. It all depends on what's been said before. That's why I stay in those boundaries. I don't, I don't, I don't get a topic and then you know, find a verse to go preach. Mm -mm. I get a verse and then figure out what the topic is. 
because I want to stay in between these two covers. I'm not comfortable outside of it. I don't even like talking about politics. I, I like it right in here. I like my nose right in here. So I want to stay because I know that's what's best for you and me. And me. The giftings. Have you found yours? Are you seriously looking for it? If you're not, let me beg you to. We'll pick up next week with the next one. We're not off the hook. I know most of you don't have the gift of prophecy, but I guarantee you there are going to be some we're going to look at that you probably do. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you this morning for Paul's words and for his limitation, his qualification on this gift as it existed back in the day. And Lord, we look at our world and we look at at the stage of Christianity, and we see how so many have perverted and twisted and misrepresented what you said and what actually happened. And in almost every case, it was, it's been for personal gain. It's been for financial reward. And God, it seems like the church, especially in America, is willing to accept any and all, anything goes, as long as they sound right, as long as they claim to be God's messenger. But Lord, you put that qualification in there. If it doesn't agree, if it doesn't compare with our faith delivered once for all to the saints from the apostles in the word of God, is to be rejected. God, give us discernment. Don't let us be ugly or angry about it, but God, we've got to get over this hump. The lives and, and, and Christian future of our children depend on this, that they not go astray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us guidance. It's here if we'll just read it. Lord, again, I pray for everyone here. May they find their gifting. May they actively seek it, pursue it, and then use it for your honor and glory to build your church so that one day when we stand before you, we can hear you say, well done. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.